Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Asher Kaufman, and I'm the director of the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. As a peace institute, we follow the news coming from Afghanistan with desperation and uh, frustration. The desperation comes from witnessing the human tragedy unfolding, from seeing, seeing the thousands of Afghans trying to flee their country. We are anxious about the millions who will surely stay and live under a regime with no power to influence or counter its likely abusive practices. The progress that Afghan civil society and specifically women have gained in the past two decades is all under threat now. The vast network of Afghan peace builders, some of whom collaborate with us at Croc, is now under extreme and existential threat. The frustration comes from the fact that as a peace institute, we have been strong, strong uh, critics, critics of American militaristic policies that have dictated its actions in Afghanistan and that have brought us to this uh, moment. Since 2001, Croc faculty, some of whom are still teaching at the Institute, including David Courtright, who moderates this panel, have been critical of US response to the 9-11 terror attacks, including the occupation of, of Afghanistan and uh, Iraq. For us at uh, Croc, there was hardly any question that US militarism was not the right response to that horrific uh, event on September 11, 2001. Most of us agree that American military presence in Afghanistan should have been terminated years ago. During these 20 years, Afghanistan preoccupied our work at the Institute in multiple uh, ways. We have had Afghan uh, students as well as American students who served in Afghanistan as US, uh, as US uh, soldiers. Some of us, uh, some of our faculty conducted research on the American military presence in Afghanistan and on peace building efforts in the country. Most recently, faculty from the Peace Accords Matrix Initiative have been analyzing the conditions for successful uh, peace negotiations in Afghanistan and were scheduled to publish a report on their findings within a few days. This report is now publicly available on the Peace Accords Matrix website, but the conditions on the ground do not bode well for a process that would bring all political forces in Afghanistan into a peace deal. What we are witnessing is the opposite. We thought that as a peace institute, it was important for us to organize this flash panel so as to offer our thoughts about the unfolding events and to suggest some paths uh, forward. There is, no best, there is no person best, more suitable than David Courtright to moderate this uh, panel. 10 years ago, as President Obama was escalating the war in Afghanistan, David published a, a book titled Ending, Ending Obama's uh, War, Responsible Military Withdrawal from uh, Afghanistan. Unfortunately, 10 years later, we are witnessing a military withdrawal that could and should have been done in a more uh, responsible uh, way. David, uh, the floor is yours and for the rest of the panelists. Uh, thank you, Asher. Thank you very much. And uh, welcome to all of our guests uh, for today's program. Uh, our Afghan colleague, uh, Hila Nazibola, who uh, was planned, uh, scheduled to be with us, unfortunately could not join us. So we've asked uh, a couple of other Afghan colleagues to participate in today's program, and they've graciously agreed to do so, uh, Samaya Savardse and Salim Halali. Um, we're grateful for them for agreeing to be with us in today's important conversation. Uh, what I will do now is I'll, I'll introduce our five panelists, uh, and then each of them will speak for approximately seven minutes, seven to 10 minutes. Uh, then we'll have some bit of conversation among the panelists, and I'll I'll begin to ask some of the questions that many of you in the audience have already submitted, and I suspect more will be coming in as we progress with the program today. So let's proceed directly uh, to Samaya Savardse. Sam Samaya, please. Uh, thank you, David, and um, for having me uh, today. Uh, though we wish for different circumstances to uh, gather together here, 
uh, but I would like to uh, touch on a few uh, points uh, from my side. First, I want to talk about the situation at the Kabul airport. Today, uh, around, a, around 6 o'clock, there were two blasts near to uh, east gate of the Kabul airport. Uh, and uh, per the news that we are receiving from the ground, the casualties are increasing. There are civilians, tens of civilians, at least uh, emergency uh, hospital in Kabul reported, uh, received of uh, 60 people, 60 injured civilian um, in the hospital. And at least for now, they confirm six deaths. Uh, but the footage that we are uh, watching from uh, from the Kabul airport is very devastating. I, I, I'm afraid the number of uh, casualties are increasing uh, minute by minute. It's very sad. The question is, uh, was it preventable? Uh, there are many alerts yesterday uh, came out from the um, uh, from different sources from the U United States Embassy from the United Kingdom Kingdom and we try to share that and there are in the different media and outlet they were sharing that the the Kabul airport is under attack and there are uh, serious threats from ISIS people receive this uh, these messages but did they believe that? Uh, I would say no. Uh, they were desperate, first of all. They still um, insisting to be there at the Kabul airport because for, not, for them, it, it might sound the only way out. And uh, the, right now, the, the rumors are um, uh, diluting the, the environment. And there are rumors about that, uh, the, about this, uh, these threats that they say is they are not, uh, they were not um, trustworthy because they believe that the foreigner are going to scatter the civilians and they want to only evacuate those who want. And so uh, people do not trust. And uh, it's the reason that we today uh, are witnessing this um, very sad incident in Kabul. Uh, talking about situation in Afghanistan, you are probably uh, uh, following the news and the news are focused on Kabul and the uh, Kabul airport. But I want to talk about uh, from different lens. I am an educator. I worked the last 10 years in Afghanistan and worked with the Ministry of Education with, the, with UNICEF to work on education and to, um, to promote girls' education and universal education in Afghanistan. And what we are uh, hearing now from, from the ground, from, from, from students, from teachers, uh, is a different aspect of what's going on in Afghanistan. So uh, do that the um, spokesman, uh, sp uh, spoke person of the Taliban is saying that they, they are not against uh, education and girls education in particular. What we are hearing from the ground is uh, different. Uh, in Herat, uh, they allowed uh, the midterm, mid-year examination last week for all the grades, all the primary and secondary uh, grades, and the students were went to the schools, all the students, uh, girls and boys, and they uh, took the exams. And now we are in a one, one week uh, break. But teachers, female teachers, received uh, letters from, from the officials in the Herat uh, and uh, different other uh, department of education that they shouldn't go back, uh, particularly those who teach the uh, upper secondary grades. So it means Taliban are seeking to what they, uh, what we know about them from before, that they only allow girls to get education up uh, until uh, age 12. From 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 uh, students and in universities also they 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 experience different different level of uh, despair and uh, frustration. First, uh, girls uh, who were in the university they were told that they are not they shouldn't come to university and their education in tertiary level is not allowed. But later, Taliban said no. We are waiting for the senior leadership to decide about that. And they allowed the administration, uh, the female administration of university to come back and only work in segregated uh, offices. Uh, 
but what we are hearing now is that uh, it's not certain. It's not uh, uh, students are not certain that they are going to come back to the university. Taliban are saying that uh, this, the reason that they want female and, and girls and women to stay at home is because the security situation and the, and the fluid environment uh, in Afghanistan. So they they ask them to wait. But but uh, the question that came to mind of many of uh, girls and women is uh, are they are Taliban uh, trustworthy? Are they keeping their words? They reference to the, the period of 1991 to 2001 that uh, yes, they were um, saying the same at the beginning, the first months that Taliban took over Afghanistan, they were allowing the minority to practice their rituals, they allow women to keep uh, going to schools, uh, uh, but after a month, uh, everything uh, kind of uh, blocked for, for women and, and girls. What we want now and what they want on the ground, uh, as David mentioned, uh, a big majority of the Afghans are going to stay in Afghanistan. And we are talking about 30 plus million uh, Afghans, half of them are uh, women and girls. They, they will stay. They, will, uh, they don't have any other option. And they, for different reasons, they are going to stay. But they want the, I mean, they are now uh, um, speaking up on, on their uh, red line and they are saying that for, for girls and women, they are asking for, for, for education and uh, access to education as the, as the minimum that they want. They don't uh, ask for a nice democratic, democratic system because it wasn't, it wasn't even the case during the last 20, 20 years, but they want that education is allowed for them. Education facilities uh, run again and female teachers are allowed and universities uh, accepting them uh, again. Yesterday in, her, in Afghanistan, the uh, result of the entrance, uh, um, university entrance exam were out. And again, uh, like, last, like last year, a girl uh, took the first place in the um, university exam. But, but even when she was talking about the future, when she, we expect her to be happy and about this result, she wasn't. She didn't know about the, the future for her and uh, her generation. So uh, here, um, I don't know if there's the right platform, but I want the international community if Taliban or an inclusive uh, government with the majority of Taliban, influence of Taliban is going to uh, happen in Afghanistan, the international community needs to set up some uh, kind of uh, uh, watch to, uh, uh, to help uh, this kind of rights, minimum rights, uh, get observed by Taliban. So I would like uh, to close uh, um, my, my, my uh, words here, and uh, we, uh, we will talk in the QA and later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samaya. And um, Samaya is a Fulbright Scholar with an MA in International Education and Policy Analysis from Stanford University. And as she mentioned, she's worked with the uh, the educational uh, program in Afghanistan over the past 10 years with a special focus on uh, early childhood and K-12 education. Uh, joining us next is uh, Salim Halali, who is a co-founder and CEO for Global Impact Management Consulting, a US-based Afghan uh, diaspora firm. He's an international development professional with experience in Afghanistan, South Asia, and the Middle East. Salim, please. Thank you so much, uh, David. Thank you so much, everyone. And thanks a lot for the opportunity to, to speak today. Um, I wanted to build on a couple of points that my uh, distinguished colleague, uh, Ms. Sarvarzadeh, referred to. Um, the situation, as, um, as, as, as Dr. Kaufman explained it very well, is one of desperation and frustration. And I want to focus my remarks on a number of, uh, on a number of topics. Um, at an, at an individual level, uh, we are going uh, through a number of mixed emotions. Uh, we, as, uh, as, as the broader Afghan uh, community of professionals who have been working in Afghanistan for the last 21 years uh, in education, economic development, uh, social development, and many other schemes are 
confused. Uh, we're disappointed. Uh, we are raging and we are unbelievably concerned about what the future holds for all of us. It's uncertain. Um, and, and I think that that would in most cases be a complete understatement of what um, the situation holds um, you know, in the country. Uh, we are worried about the country. We're worried about uh, our families. We're worried about our friends. We're worried about our colleagues. Uh, this uh, situation continues to put an enormous pressure on everybody uh, that has been in Afghanistan for the last uh, for the last uh, 20, 21 years. I'm now going to move on to to talk about uh, you know the attack. Um, uh, it's it's a heinous attack, um, and there are a number of messages that this attack is going to send. First of all, it is going to explain the first failure of the new uh, governors. Uh, of, uh, of Afghanistan and in particular in Kabul. This is the first uh, mass scale attack that has killed a you know, number of civilians uh, on their watch. Um, so that, that is, that is, that is, that is a, a security failure. The reason that this is an intelligence failure uh, is, is has to do more with confused uh, lack of transparent and consistent communication from the US and its allies. Um, in our conversations with, with different uh, uh, think tanks here, uh, Afghan American diaspora communities, and any opportunity we had to, 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 to get our messages across to the US government was, please make sure that the messaging is consistent, that it is transparent, that it is trustworthy. So I cannot agree more with my colleague, Ms. Arvazada, that the <clears throat> messages were, you know, did not carry any weight, unfortunately. One, because people do not trust those messages. Also, what the US government continues to tell people, uh, you know, using their platforms is contradicting what's happening on the ground at the Kabul airport. The second point I wanted to mention with regards to the attack and the message it sends is, is an evident example of <clears throat> other players, additional players, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the ongoing conflict. If anybody thought that the fall of the previous government and the uh, success of uh, the Taliban was an end to the conflict, uh, I think should be asking a lot, of, a lot of questions. This, I don't think is the end. I think there are a lot of regional players and that's why everybody you know, in the peacemaking avenue has to start uh, their concentrated efforts. Um, on that, on that, on that front, um, why the focus on Kabul Airport? I'm going to make my remarks very short on this one. Uh, Kabul Airport, at this point in time, is the only window of opportunity for hundreds of thousands of desperate Afghans who currently would like to flee. <clears throat> if you look at the situation and think about it for a minute, uh, in the larger geography of Afghanistan, and even in the larger uh, a regional geography, the window to a, a different society and, 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 and definitely an, 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 an uncertain society just crumbles down to this one uh, airport gate. Now, this is also a reminiscent of the situation through the rest of the country as well. This situation is, is you know, depicts the reality across the rest of the country. This is our window to see what's happening through, you know, through the rest of the country. <clears throat> I'm now going to switch uh, and, and, and talk about a couple of challenges that are currently at hand and that are beyond the situation at the Kabul airport, which is a human catastrophe. <clears throat> we, so, and, and this is also going to, to touch on, on, on hopes and fears uh, that many of us as Afghans are currently faced with. Um, since August 16, uh, there is absolutely no information as to how the government of Afghanistan will look like. Who will government? Who will govern Afghanistan? What shape or form will it have? Is it going to be a republic? Is it going to be an emirate? Is it going to be a mix of both? That adds a lot to the fears people have. Um, the only messaging we get uh, from the Taliban is that they are working on a government the government will be broad-based 
it is going to be inclusive, but we don't know just how. That is one of the major, major challenges. Legitimacy, obviously, is one is, is another key challenge that everybody faces at this point. Um, service delivery. Uh, currently, uh, you know, across the entire country, service delivery has come to a complete standstill. There are millions of government employees who have not been paid, who do not know if they will be paid. Now, if think of the economic costs of all of this in a country where drought was already ravaging across the country, poverty was at 57% the last time any data was made available on Afghanistan. Now, combine that with a cease on all of development efforts. As somebody who has spent you know, my entire life in development, I can tell you how dependent the Afghan population is on international development. The millions of dollars that were in, avail, made available to Afghanistan through NGOs, through development contractors, were making significant contributions to the economy. The, the Afghan GDP was, 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 was predominantly um, dependent on foreign aid. Um, and then, of course, uh, add to that the freeze on all Afghan assets that are currently in the United States uh, and, 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 else, and elsewhere. On the hope side, um, it's, it's very important to, um, to, to, to note the fact that anytime there has been such a significant regime change in Afghanistan, it has not been bloodless. Um, the fact that we currently do not have a full-scale civil war uh, offers hope into the future. Um, it, it's, it's not to say that the current uh, you know, events did not have uh, you know, any, 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 um, any bloodshed, unfortunately, but compared to, to, to many other changes that, that have happened over, 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 the last, over the recent history. The restraint shown by the Taliban um, is, 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 is an opportunity to be hopeful. Um, what we have um, at this point in time is, uh, uh, is, 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 is views to see how they are treating the politicians, the former politicians, the former senior government of officials. Um, uh, those are uh, things that I think are offering uh, some hope um, into, the, into, the, into the future. Um, two additional quick points uh, towards the, the end of my remarks. Um, it's very important to um, look at the impact of the current situation and the events unfolding in Afghanistan on regional politics. Um, <clears throat> this, you know, this the current situation has allowed you know significant influence of new players, uh, you know, in the region, uh, keeping our focus, you know, on the peace and peacemaking um, in Afghanistan. I think. Um, the new regional players, uh, such as China, um, and, and obviously the long-term regional influencer, uh, you know, particularly when it comes to uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, they must make concentrated efforts for a lasting peace uh, in Afghanistan. I think the people of Afghanistan have witnessed enough, enough is enough, and it's really time to stop the bloodshed. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Salim. Uh, next, we'll hear from Lisa Shirk. She is the Richard G. Starman Visiting Professorship Chair in Peace Studies at the Kroc Institute and a research fellow at the Toda Institute. She's the author of 10 books, including the edited volume, The Ecology of Violent Extremism, Perspectives in Peacebuilding and Human Security. Lisa. Thank you, David, and, and everyone who's spoken. Thank you for your comments. I'll just give a little bit more background um, on my own experience in Afghanistan. I was traveling to and from Afghanistan for about five years, from 2009 to 2017 or 2013. And my research was focused on local peacebuilding traditions, approaches, and the civil society groups that had operated even before 9-11, uh, so under the Taliban. 
to find out what kinds of programming in peace building they were doing and how they negotiated civil society space. I also taught peace studies courses at Kabul University. And um, in 2019, I was in Istanbul for a consultation on the design of the peace process to make it more inclusive and just. Um, and right now, along with hundreds of other civil society groups around the world, I'm filling in visa forms and searching for charter flights, trying to evacuate Afghan colleagues. Uh, there is an urgent scramble to save lives, but also to save the brain trust. The leaders of these movements and the history that they've had actually working under the Taliban and, and having some of the understanding of what kind of programming might be able to continue. As somebody in the peace building field, I, I just also want to comment on the massive experiment in top down really uh, military led multi dimensional efforts to establish a liberal peace. Uh, there have been many books written about liberal peace building and, and many commenters are saying this, this is a failure. This is this does not work. Uh, this fantasy of firepower solutions to difficult problems is tempting, but it's an empty promise and it has come to a terrifying end. Uh, for everybody in the country, but especially for those who, who spoke out on behalf of women's rights and, and human rights. Some thousands of, of Afghan civil society leaders are now at risk. So I want to give 10 quick points on the implications of Afghanistan for the peace building field at large. And the first one really goes to, to my original research, uh, because there is an assumption among many peace builders that the field started with Boutros Boutros Ghali's speech and a publication at the United Nations called an agenda for peace, where peace building as a term was defined officially and many uh, governments and international organizations began their peace building program at that time. But the field of peace building is much older than that. Um, there were Afghan peace building processes such as the Shura and the Jirga that were very successful in addressing local conflicts far earlier than uh, the 1990s. And in, in 1980s, in fact, uh, a British group called Working With Conflict, it's an, it's an NGO, uh, trained a few dozen Afghans in the fundamentals of conflict analysis and conflict transformation. And that cohort of Afghan peace builders has done tremendous work. Uh, some of them have been in government, some of them have been in civil society, some went on to obtain graduate degrees, but it, it does speak to, you know, training cohorts of people who could work together. What we see in Afghanistan is that model does really work. There, these 30 Afghans approximately that were trained in the 1980s have maintained contact and have done a, a tremendous amount of good for the country. The second point, though, is that it was mostly male Afghan civil society, of course, because women did not have rights and freedoms, et cetera, under the Taliban in the 1990s. So most of the original peace building organizations were started by men, had mostly male staff. Um, the kinds of activities that they were doing was peace education for youth, peace training for community leaders like shuras, and they did mediations between tribal conflicts over land, water, and governance. Um, and all of those peace building activities were acceptable under the Taliban. So much of the field can, much of the work of peace building can continue. Um, I'll explain why it's become more complicated. Of course, the exclusion of women and girls has always been a central problem in Afghanistan. And many of these male peace builders were actually even in the 1990s, trying to negotiate with religious leaders and tribal leaders to try to sort of address this exclusion of women and to see the exclusion that was blamed on Islam or credited to, that Islam somehow should, told, told people to exclude women and saying, no, actually Islam, allows women to have education and to participate as leaders. Um, and that much of this sort of sexist discourse was really um, more tribal in nature rather than religious. The third point is that in the early years after the US ouster of the Taliban, Afghan civil society continued to conduct programs um, that really were, were able to operate because the peace builders acted as humanitarians. 
And humanitarians, as we know, like the Red Cross, they carefully negotiate access with all sides. And they really protect that independent space because they know they can't do their work of humanitarian aid unless they're acceptable to all sides. And so in the early years, the first 10 years of uh, the US and, and the international forces, um, most of Afghan civil society was still trying to be fairly independent and impartial because of the threat of the Taliban um, and because they needed access to Taliban areas. But then eventually by 2011, um, the International Security Assistance Force, ISAF, and the international aid agencies we're just starting to become aware that there was local Afghan civil society. So before that, there were dozens, hundreds of international NGOs that had been imported into Afghanistan. And actually in two, 2011, I co-facilitated a meeting with some of my Afghan colleagues between the heads of Western-based NGOs and local civil society groups in Kabul. So in 2011, they were told, we were told that was the first time there had been any such meeting. So the international NGO community had also ignored local civil society. Um, and really INGOs were essentially then competing with local NGOs and not coordinating and certainly not empowering local Afghan civil society voices, which we know is actually a best practice of our field. Now, by 2011, there was still the sense that there was a lack of local capacity when many of us who've been working in Afghanistan knew that wasn't true. There were Afghans with master's degrees in transitional justice and conflict transformation. There was a lot of capacity within civil society, but it wasn't being drawn upon and it was really excluded still from much of the thinking about the peace process. The fifth point is that, you know, what ended up happening once the international aid agencies and, and ISAF figured out that Afghan civil society was there, they kind of turned them into what they called implementing partners. So they, they weren't like listening to Afghan civil society about what kind of peace building needed to be done. They were contracting with Afghan civil society to implement foreign designed programs. Um, and again, it was not about the empowerment of civil society. Um, it did generate jobs. It brought in money for many of these peace building organizations, but they still weren't really actually being listened to about what they needed to, what they thought should happen for the vision of their country. This was really an NGOization, we call like the NGO creation of all these Afghan groups. And some of them were pre up corrupt and some of them were fake because there was such an influx of cash into the country. And my Afghan colleagues, you know, note, they, they knew which NGOs were legitimate and which ones were not. Um, there was so much money coming into the country, this metaphor of pouring water on a rock was used often. Uh, there was just too much money to be meaningfully put to good use. So the solution to some of these problems is not necessarily more money. There was plenty of money in Afghanistan. The sixth point is that local peace building really became implicated and consumed as part of a war effort. So funding streams to NGOs in Afghanistan increasingly became focused on what's called countering violent extremism, which is definitely a partial, not an independent stance when you are basically joining with military forces to counter the Taliban. And so it was in this phase that Afghan civil society, as we know today, really became, they, they lost their partiality, they lost their acceptance, those of them that did have acceptance under the Taliban. Um, they became implementing partners of the international security mission. Actually, with the University of Notre Dame, we conducted research at this point with the UN on whether the Geneva Convention principles for humanitarian access could also be applied to Afghan NGOs because uh, ISAF military vehicles were pulling up in front of the doors of ISAF. Afghan NGOs and going in looking for implementing partners and partnerships. And, you know, the Taliban had eyes everywhere and they would see these military vehicles in front of NGO offices and assume that, that the NGOs were working with uh, the international forces. So it was actually just like putting a target right onto their front door and, and attacks against NGOs increased a great deal under that military strategy of going out looking for these kind of implementing partners 
for CVE, Countering Violent Extremism Programming. So the seventh lesson, um, the next real complication here is that the US Patriot Act and the counterterrorism laws uh, were also making communication with Taliban dangerous, if not illegal, for any Afghan civil society group that was taking aid money from a Western donor. Um, so the, these counterterrorism laws prohibit any sort of contact really with the Taliban. At the time I was teaching at Kabul University, one of my students was a, a Taliban sympathizer and in legal uh, consultation, I was told, you know, that I could be arrested for just teaching somebody in my class about negotiation or conflict assessment. So these, these rules about counterterrorism were very fuzzy and it made a lot of the Afghan civil society very nervous about having any contact with, with the Taliban. The eighth point, the danger to all Afghan civil society has really increased because of this history of how the international community related to local groups. Um, while the Taliban leaders have now promised not to retaliate, most of us don't necessarily believe that because there are so many Taliban factions and those factions are targeting Afghan women, prohibiting girls from going to school. The, the retaliatory executions have already started and that is our worst fear about what's going to happen. So we need to continue to press the Taliban government to stop their forces from retaliating on civil society. Final points here, protecting the Afghan peacebuilding brain trust is a distinct priority. So there's a whole group of human rights defenders that we need to protect, but the Afghan peace builders are going to be the ones that can help negotiate access and dialogue in order to continue girls' education and to continue to allow women's rights in some sense of moving forward into the future. So, uh, Afghan peace builders have a really key role to play, and that's why I think they need to be a priority to evacuating them. And finally, we, our field just needs to learn a lesson about how are we going to negotiate with peace talks that really have nothing to do with the peace processes that we know work. The US-led Afghan peace talks failed to practice any of the lessons about the peace, about how a peace process should be designed. So it was military-led, US diplomats, even from the State Department were sort of pushed out. The UN, Muslim countries like Turkey and Indonesia, European countries, basically anybody else would have had more credibility and I think the outcome would have been different. Uh, so with that, uh, I, I leave you for today. Thanks. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, next, we'll hear from Mahan Mirsa. Mahan is the executive director of the Rafat and Zareen Ansari Institute for Global Engagement with Religion here at the Keough School of Global Affairs. Uh, Mahan is a, an Islamic studies scholar, an expert on religious literacy, earned a PhD in religious studies from Yale University, and is the former dean of faculty at Zaytuna College in Berkeley, America's first accredited Muslim liberal arts college. Mahan, please. Thanks, David. Um, and thanks to my distinguished colleagues. This is a flash panel. The situation is fluid. We're all processing what's happening. My thoughts will bounce around, but I have three overarching points I'd like to make, partly overlapping with, but also complementing what we've heard from Samaya Salim and Lisa, and I look forward to the discussion later. So one, against US militarism, war is hell across the board for men, children, the trees, ecology, and for women. Number two, where we are right now, the Taliban must be constructively engaged, not shunned. And three, religion, can help us. While religion has now taken center stage, we should remember that this was not originally a war about religion. It was about secular ideologies in competition for global domination. Godless communism versus free market capitalism, religion was instrumentalized in that war. President Carter's national security advisor, Zbigniew Brzezinski, is on record for admitting that the US deliberately provoked the Soviets to invade Afghanistan in 1979. The purpose? To give the Soviets their Vietnam. 
like the great powers that came before, the Afghans were once again used as means to an end, this time by dueling superpowers in a Cold War. The ambitions of great powers required the calculated undignifying of others, in this case, the Afghans, to serve their own interests. The decision to give the Soviets their Vietnam resulted in a decade-long war in the 1980s. An estimated 1.8 million people were killed, 1.5 million disabled, including more than 300,000 children, over 6 million refugees, and approximately 10 million unexploded landmines. According to the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University, the post 9-11 wars have forcibly displaced at least 38 million people and nearly another 1 million have been killed across Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, and Pakistan. Yes, the Taliban have checkpoints. Do you know about our checkpoints? Journalists Leila al aryan and Chris Hedges in their book, Collateral Damage, have documented the impact of US checkpoints in Iraq. And I quote, troops fearful of explosives packed into vehicles and rocket propelled grenades often open fire on cars they deem to be suspicious. Veterans said that shooting of civilians at checkpoints was so frequent it ceased to be regarded as unusual. There are no estimates of civilian deaths at checkpoints. But these veterans said it ran into the hundreds or the thousands, end quote. So is there chaos? Naturally. Are bad elements like ISIL-K going to try to take advantage of the situation without doubt? But how can we expect the Taliban to succeed against ISIL-K when the US military has failed? We need to stop shunning Taliban central and cooperate with them. From what we know, the Taliban have been facilitating the evacuations. They were targeted side by side by Americans in this morning's bombing at Kabul airport. Americans and Taliban together, targeted by ISIS. Think about it. Nazia Kazi, who will be here in November for our 9-11 series at the Keogh School later this semester, she says that the best way to combat terrorism is through critical thinking. So think people, war is not clean. Do you know what airstrikes do? They rip people's bodies to shreds. Advocates of militarism who are concerned for women's rights must know that our wars shred the bodies of men and women alike. Those on the periphery of the blast take a little longer to die agonizing deaths. They're not televised. Have the Taliban hunted people? Yes. Have we? And by we, I mean us, you, us. Among the many encounters, Anand Gopal reports in No Good Men Among the Living, America, the Taliban, and the war through Afghan eyes is one with Sharafuddin, an elderly Afghan man who ran a bakery. He had fought the jihad against the Soviets, still had a bullet lodged in his arm, shrapnel in his back, and a prosthetic testicle. After the Soviet withdrawal, he had left politics. But when the US went hunting for the Taliban after 9-11, middlemen wanting to please tipped off the Americans. Here's another one. They picked him up. He pled innocence to no avail. Metal hooks were inserted in his mouth and twisted. He screamed. They applied electric shocks. His hands and feet were bound. He was hung upside down for 18 days, 23 hours a day. He says, I was dangling there like a goat in a butcher shop. I even pissed on myself. I tasted my own piss. It tasted like battery acid. Sharafuddin is not an aberration. This is how we have prosecuted the war on terror. So this is my first point. War is hell. You are being shown only one side of it. The same market forces that propel our wars run the media. Don't be fooled. The line between the good guys and the bad guys 
is not always so clear. Now, let me turn to my second point. There's every reason to believe that the Taliban must be recognized and constructively engaged. They are saying the right things. They are doing the right things. Under the present circumstances, what more could we expect of them? What are the alternatives? I let my colleague, Laurie Nathan, say more about how the international community can respond. And he may very well disagree with my perspective. But let me leave you with a couple of closing thoughts. First, there are Taliban and there are Taliban. The TTP, Tariqe Taliban of Pakistan, are an entirely different entity. Many, if not most Taliban fighters, although the word means students, are illiterate. You think of, I'm gonna give you an analogy, think of Republicans, and that's not a joke. On the one end, there's the January 6th kind of Republicans. On the other end, there's the Liz Cheney and Adam Kinziger kind. Somewhere in there are the likes of former libertarian Congressman Ron Paul. I don't mean to pick on Republicans. Democrats are the same. You have AOC and you have Joe Manchin. It's a spectrum. It's the human condition. If you believe the Taliban are also human, you can bet your bottom dollar they have their share of hawks and doves, their opportunists, their statesmen, their nut jobs, and their geniuses. When we hear the Taliban say they're doing this, but look over there, they're doing that, think more carefully about what might be going on. Don't let the fringe dictate our engagement. When I say engage the Taliban, I mean engage the ones at the center who are trying to govern. They have traveled internationally. They know several languages. They held an open press conference with the global media. They're on Twitter. Engage the Twitter Taliban. Twitter wasn't around in, in the 1990s. That's new. And so 2.0 can be different. They need our help and they can help us. Just imagine the position of the Taliban. Here we are scorning them and there stands ISIL thinking they've sold out to the Americans. Think. Moving to my last point, religion, Islam, is our ally. It can help us go a long way, even if not for many, all the way in advancing women's rights. We need improvements on the rights of women everywhere to varying degrees, whether it's our allies like Saudi Arabia, our enemies like Iran, or even right here in the land of the free. Taliban norms around gender are inflected with their local tribal culture. Engagement with the texts and traditions of Islam in dialogue with the wider ummah, the worldwide community of Muslims who are infinitely diverse will only help not harm the cause of women's rights in Afghanistan. Most importantly, it will do so on their own terms, which as we know, is the best starting point for strategic peace building. Just to fill this in a little bit, the Prophet Muhammad's wife, Khadija, was a merchant. She was his employer. She is the one who asked for his hand in marriage. She took the initiative, not the other way around. The oldest continually, continually operating university in the world is the Qarawiyin. It's in Fez, Morocco. It was founded by a female, Fatima al-Fahri. Zaytuna College was in some ways inspired by that in the year 859 CE. I've studied from the same books the Taliban study from. One hadith primer, the Mishkat al Masabi, it's called the Niche of Lamps, reports the following saying of the Prophet Muhammad The quest for knowledge is incumbent on every Muslim, male and female. It's explicit. The Arabic includes both explicitly. Talabul ilmi faridatun ala kulli muslimin wa muslimatin, the female. This saying even contains the word talab that has the same etymology as Taliban, student. We can work through the Sharia, not against it, to reach the hearts of the Taliban. Their hearts beat just like ours. They have endured generations of trauma. Enough with the brow beating. It's time to heal the hearts. Earlier this week, I published an op-ed that had the title, Biden's Options in Afghanistan. I titled it that way. But as it went through the editorial process, the title morphed into 
to engage the Taliban, the US needs an honest debate on Sharia law. I let it go because it's not entirely inaccurate, but it's incomplete. A more complete title would have been to engage the Taliban, the US needs an honest debate on Sharia law and US imperialism. I close with a verse from the Quran and a question. This is from Surah 8, Al-Anfal. The Surah, the chapter title means the spoils of war. If the enemy is inclined towards peace, make peace with them and put your trust in God. Indeed, he alone is the all hearing, all knowing. So the real question is not the Taliban or Sharia or Islam. Nazia Kazi, who I mentioned earlier, calls it Islamo diversion. The real question is, is the United States of America willing to rethink its military industrial complex? That's it, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mahan. Our last speaker is uh, Laurie Nathan. Laurie is the director of the Kroc Institute Mediation Program. He serves on the UN Academic Advisory Council on Mediation and has been a participant in many high-level mediation efforts in Africa and with the various subunits of the African Union and the regional organizations. Uh, Laurie, please. Uh, David, thank you. And greetings to our panelists and greetings to members of the audience. I want to address the question of how the international community should deal with the Taliban-led government. My aim is to propose a framework for addressing this question rather than to offer detailed and definitive answers. The question is somewhat premature because the situation in Afghanistan is very fluid and a new government has not yet been formed. However, the question is already being addressed in international circles with some prominent figures in the West insisting that there should be no recognition of a Taliban-led government while other politicians have threatened the Taliban with sanctions. In addressing the question, I'll identify what I think is the overarching priority and consideration, the goals and the challenges in the international community's response to a Taliban-led government. By international community, I mean the UN, including in particular the UN Security Council, the European Union, major global and regional powers, as well as development and humanitarian actors. The overarching priority and consideration should be the best interests of the people of Afghanistan. And this is, of course, a complicated issue because the Afghan people comprise diverse communities and groups with different values and different needs and interests. It's also a complicated issue because it's not easy for us outside the country to hear the voices of Afghans inside the country, as opposed to our friends who are in the diaspora. Still. It's worth insisting constantly and consistently that the best interests of the Afghan people should be the priority consideration in shaping the international community's response. And I say this because much of the policy debate currently in the US has focused instead on America's strategic and economic interests. No doubt other major powers are determining their response according to their national interests rather than those of the Afghan people. In broad terms, the interests of the Afghan people as a whole can be captured by five goals. First, to ensure respect for basic human rights, including women's rights. Second, to ensure respect for international humanitarian law. Three, to ensure that fundamental needs for security, safety, welfare, and dignity are met. Four, to avoid reprisals against Afghans who are part of the ousted government and security forces, and against Afghans who have led the struggle for women's rights and other human rights. And fifth, to ensure the continued provision of humanitarian assistance to those in need. Now, these goals are obviously much easier stated than achieved. There are numerous vexing challenges and dilemmas. I'll highlight only four of them. First, given its track record, a Taliban government is likely to be seriously opposed to some or all aspects 
of the goals that I've just outlined. It would not be a legitimate government and it has a history of violence and repression against the people of Afghanistan. Second challenge is that the international community is unlikely to be united on how to respond to a Taliban government. The UN Security Council has issued a unified press statement, but it remains to be seen whether the US, the United Kingdom and France on the one hand and China and Russia on the other will maintain a unified stance. The more united they are, the greater the pressure on the Taliban to behave responsibly, both domestically and externally. The less, unif the less unified the permanent five members of the Security Council are, the greater the space for the Taliban to engage in repressive action. Third challenge is that external coercive pressure on the Taliban in response to human rights atrocities and systemic repression will run the risk of being counterproductive. That coercive pressure could reinforce a hardline stance or reinforce the position of the most hardline elements within the Taliban. It could strengthen the Taliban's ties to countries that are willing to bypass sanctions, non-recognition and other forms of pressure. And it could make the Taliban resistant to cooperation with international humanitarian agencies. Fourth, it remains to be seen whether there is sustained violent and nonviolent resistance to Taliban rule. Such resistance will pose an acute dilemma for sectors of the international community that strongly oppose Taliban rule and support democracy. International support for the resistance may limit the international community's ability to deliver humanitarian assistance. Now, how these challenges are addressed will depend in the future on several factors. These include which faction of the Taliban is ascendant. It will depend on the actual behavior of a Taliban-led government. It will depend on the composition of that government and the extent to which the government is inclusive. It will depend on the extent of unity among key global actors. And it will depend on the role of regional actors. It will also depend on the needs and vulnerabilities of a Taliban-led government. If the Taliban-led government seeks to meet the security, welfare, and humanitarian needs of citizens, if only for the pragmatic reason of building stability and legitimacy in order to minimize resistance, then that government will require external assistance. And this opens the possibility of negotiation and other forms of engagement between sectors of the international community and the Taliban. Most importantly, and finally, the international community's response to the Taliban should be based above all on the needs, interests, and views of Afghan themselves. The mediation program and other units in the Kroc Institute will continue to provide a platform for those views. Thank you, back to David. Well, thank you all of you and the panelists. Thank you all the panelists and uh, maybe everyone should go on screen now so we could have conversation. Um, there have been many dozens of questions pouring in from our audience uh, came in beforehand and while we've been speaking. Um, so to begin uh, responding, uh, I'll, I think I'll focus on a question that several uh, members of the audience asked, namely, uh, what can we do to address the uh, continuing humanitarian needs of the Afghan people uh, and the social development programs that have been funded by external support? Uh, some of the panelists already mentioned this, but uh, could we say more about how in today's situation, uh, more effort can be made to ensure that humanitarian aid gets through? Maybe I might ask Samaya and Salim to start us off in responding to that, if you could. Thank you, David. Uh, two points on this. Uh, I would build on what uh, Lawrence and Mohan mentioned earlier. First of all, uh, we need to consider, and it should be priority, the needs of Afghans, those who stayed. Right now, the focus is uh, on evacuation and those um, uh, very small group that go out. and. 
and but we need to also understand that who those who go out there are the members of uh, local NGOs and those local NGOs at the at the beginning they were not grassroots they were not representing I, I would say most of them not representing the views of the people on the ground rather they came from the from outside they were some of them were diaspora coming to the back to Afghanistan with this with understanding of the international uh, aid uh, the con concept of that so they they were in the better position to write proposal and ask for fund and now they are uh, I, I guess they are going to be absent how we can help the grass uh, root organization and communities to build again is one question and there are some organization international organization with good uh, term with taliban they they worked throughout this last uh, 20 years and so they they may be able to continue their work um, uh, in service delivery in afghanistan but the question is like what i mean i worked with usaid in the first um, 5 years in 2000 um, in 2009 to 2014 and one of the main concept there was not helping Taliban, not the money shouldn't go to the Taliban anyway to finance their, their, uh, their uh, war in Afghanistan. But now how, how and should we, should we allow that? Because even in the last 20 years, some of the organization officially or unofficially paid their zakat to uh, or, or one tenth of their uh, um, whatever uh, the the cost of the contract or the fund that they received from international community, they gave to Taliban one ter tenth of that to allow, to get the permission from uh, Taliban to be able to function. So is it something that we can compromise and allow that because the need is huge in Afghanistan, all the catastrophes that's going on in Afghanistan, COVID, poverty, drought, a huge, I mean, a, one of the biggest drought is again hitting Afghanistan. So is that, and they, um, Lawrence mentioned about the recognition of this upcoming government, though right now we don't know what's this government going to be, but uh, again, referencing to what happened back in 1996 to, to, to 2001, the first period the Taliban uh, governed Afghanistan, back then nobody recognized them except Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and uh, Emirates, but, but did it work or no, it's just, uh, the main victim of that decision, international decision, was was people of Afghanistan, of Afghanistan because there was no channel to pour um, humanitarian support to Af Afghan people. So I, I would say, and I and I I, 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 come, I mean I resonate what 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 has said before, the, a kind of meaningful uh, meaningful decision, but unique decision from the international com community is required. So we shouldn't end up with uh, a few government like Iran, China, Russia, and Saudi Arabia recognize Taliban and the rest of the world forget about them. And like the last period, the attention of the global media um, distracted from Afghanistan. And again, poor Afghans sacrificed there. So that's very important. And I, 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 right now, this, many of um, elite community of Afghans, they say, let's not recognize Taliban. Um, I, I would say, let's pause and wait what's going to be outcome. And let's put pressure for an inclusive government as much as possible and as much we have leverage as international community. But whatever is the outcome, let's recognize that and put pressure and let's have a um, global watch to observe the rights of minorities, women, uh, students, children, and um, uh, Afghan and civilians. So it's, uh, it's my uh, kind of thought for now. Thank you. Uh, Salim? Thank you. Uh, just, just, just building on what on what Ms. Salvarzada said. Um, let me offer two, um, two sp very specific examples of the precedence that exists, uh, even uh, when uh, the Taliban were in active conflict with the with the with the former Afghan government and its allies. The health and education sector both operated in areas that were controlled by the Taliban, and this was not a new phenomenon. From 2012-13, when the, when the former Afghan government began to lose territory, 
uh, health workers were allowed. You know, obviously there were incidents, there were crimes, um, but they were able to continue. The second point I wanna make uh, here, and this I think is going to be very relevant to this question, uh, David, is that uh, I, am an or I, 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 I have co-founded an organization that currently works in Afghanistan. My intentions are to continue to work in Afghanistan until we are definitely told not to. Because if, let's go back to, to 2000, 2001 and 2002. I think we now know that there was at the time an offer from the then Taliban to, um, to, 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 to begin to you know, have some sort of a peace agreement. But then it, it, was, it was very, very unfortunate that the then Bush administration and the new Afghan government and the Northern Alliance uh, who were intent on retaliation and revenge, said no to it. Look what happened 21 years later. That I think is the most important element for us to put pressure on. I think a couple of recommendations, very, very specific, I'm cognizant of the time. One, there are organizations, grassroots organizations that are that continue to work in Afghanistan as we speak. They are out there in rural areas, they are out there in the provinces. The Taliban have not asked any of these organizations to stop working. They haven't also imposed limitations on these organizations to do or what not to do. Our own office in Kabul at this point in time is active, it stands. We have four regional offices, all of our staff are there and we plan to begin our operations as of Sunday, this next week. Three, I think there has to be a very clear distinction when we say, let's work in Afghanistan. There is engagement with the government level. We will advocate for the international community and international organizations, the US, its allies, NATO, everybody to keep putting pressure on the Taliban. But then there is the second level of work, which is for the type of work that we do, for the type of work that local organizations do, for the type of work that NGOs do. That type of work, continued in the 19, early 1990s when we had a civil war, when the Taliban took over the government in 1994, that work continued and that work continues until this day. I think that that work also has to continue at the same, at the same time. When I say that work, it has to be peacemaking, it has to be education, it has to be economic development, jobs and training everyone. My last point um, uh, is that in addition to the talent, the diaspora talent that was there in Afghanistan that fled, let's also admit the fact that the events of the last 10 days have seen a real brain drain of the Afghans that were not part of the diaspora, the Afghans that were trained. I, I think we all know that the universities that trained Afghans uh, before were evacuated. We've lost Fulbright scholars, we've lost Chivening scholars, we've lost scholars that were trained um, you know, in, in many dozen European countries. I think the plight of the Afghan people at this point in time is real. There is an opportunity for peace and it's up to all of us to make that effort. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other panelists who might wanna comment on? Okay. I'm going to just quickly, when we think of, you know, the need for an inclusive government, we need to keep things in perspective. I was just looking up how many Native Americans have been in the U.S. Congress. In our entire history, it's 20. In our entire history, there have been 11 Black senators. When we went into Afghanistan, we put the women's quota above where our own Congress was. And so this is a complete madness. I mean, yes, we want to get there, but there's some, you know, common sense. There's some uh, sense of, uh, in, in the Sharia, if I can invoke it, there's an idea of tadrij, gradualness. We need to be wise and we need to work with intelligence in order to bring about better results. Okay. Well, there were many questions that came in about the idea of how to engage or should we engage with the Taliban, of course, some of you the panelists have, have mentioned that, but the questions are asking, you know, what concretely uh, could we do as the US and with our international partners to move forward towards some sort of engagement, possible recognition 
of uh, the Taliban government once it's announced. Um, maybe I could ask uh, Lisa and Laurie perhaps to offer some comments on that. Sure. Well, we've heard there's there's pros and cons of acknowledging the government. Uh, there's good arguments both ways. And I think this is true of many of the issues we're talking about. These are terrible trade-offs. We don't have a good option for how we protect human rights and women's rights in Afghanistan at this point. So all of us are making moral compromises in, in any stance that we take. Um, but I think for, for me, the most important thing at this point is to to make sure that the Taliban stops reprisals against civil society and anybody and all of the citizens of the country. The, the country is not going to be able to move forward if people are living in fear and hiding. And if there's assassinations going on of journalists and women's rights leaders, this is the disaster that we're now hoping does not happen next week. Um, and so the most urgent message that all of us need to be saying to our government is sort of continue to say that. If the Taliban want to be recognized, this is the center of the platform uh, of, of stopping the violence that the Taliban is doing within the country. Sorry. Yeah, just I, I would just reiterate what I was saying earlier. I think this question is going to become most pressing, although it's already on the agenda, at the point at which a Taliban government is formally established and it becomes clear what its composition and initial policies are. And that provides then clarity for engagement with the Taliban government. It's not clear to me that there is the potential for mediation, but there really will be a need for negotiation between sectors of the international community and the Taliban-led government. And that negotiation is going to depend on the respective needs and interests of the negotiating actors. My hope although it remains to be seen, is that the negotiation on the side of the international community is led by the UN, preferably by the UN Secretary General, backed by a Security Council mandate, or at least support from the Security Council, and that the Secretary, Secretary General's position is grounded in international norms, international law, UN Charter, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, so that's the position of the international community as captured by the UN, represented by the UN Secretary General, and the Taliban-led government would identify its needs of support from the international community. And that process of negotiations, if done sensitively and carefully and constructively, will certainly not achieve a best case scenario, but may be able to prevent worst case scenarios. Okay. Thank you uh, very much. Really good questions, uh, good responses to the questions. Um, another issue that's been raised uh, online and with the questions here is um, the Taliban talks about uh, their intention to create an inclusive government. Uh, and of course, they're talking to former leaders, Karzai and, and to Abdullah Abdullah. Uh, but uh, who else should be part of this inclusion? What, what do we mean by inclusion? How is it possible to bring in other sectors of society uh, within uh, Afghanistan. Um, maybe I could ask Samaya to say a few words on that and other panelists. Uh, uh, it's a difficult question to answer because as an Afghan, um, I believe throughout the last 20 years, what the international community reinforced in Afghanistan is to re I mean, strengthen the the power order that we had in Afghanistan. At community level, uh, when I went to, with a group to the community to establish a community-based school, the first person that we need to approach per the manual that we had was Arbab or the head of the village or the... So, and this reinforcing the... And right now, what's happening in Afghanistan, Taliban is approaching Karzai or... Dr. Abdullah or the other former official of the last government. And, and we believe again that they were not elected fairly uh, at the first place. And now again, they are, they are approached and they are asking, they, they get involved with Taliban and they are asking for a portion of power, even the smallest piece of the cake. And to me, it's very infuriating 
and uh, again, uh, the, the, the work that we have done in building the civil society, I, I, I would rate it not perfect and even not, but, but uh, right now they are afraid of uh, revenge and prosecution of Taliban. So how we want and how we can as international community kind of pressure to get them involved, how we want the voice of women and uh, minorities get heard. Because right now what, what, what the figures that we have in the, I mean, the, the space, they are not representing the, people. So they are out of the country and they are still say that we get back if the government get place and want a share of the power. So I don't have a concrete answer for that, but I, I, I would kind of warn my, my international uh, colleagues that be, be cautious. Who, the one that you are going to get involved, are they representing the uh, people of Afghanistan? Other panelists, any responses? Uh, Salim. Thank you. Thank you, David. If I may, um, I, I, I cannot agree more uh, on, on that point. I, I think the civil society uh, in Afghanistan is, is, is this critical mass that I think is going to offer a lot of insights. But I also wanted to, to, to point to a couple of other things. Because these events have unfolded in a pretty short period of time, you know, 2002 to 2021 is not a very long period of time. So I think the most important questions the international community and in particular the US should be asking itself is what went wrong in 2002? A government, you know, supposedly broad based and inclusive was formed in Bonn, Germany in 2000 towards, towards the end of 2001. Um, what, what, what were some of the lessons that, that, that were learned, um, you know, then? Uh, you know, fast forward, lots of things happened within 20 years. We had the first elections in 2005, kind of okay, then we had elections in 2010, then we had elections 2014. It kind of began a downward spiral, all right? Now, I do believe that engaging um, former key players is an important element, you know, if we're intent on making peace. You know, you cannot lift them out because they're gonna be, you know, you know, other elements, somebody else is going to pick them up, right? And, you know, it's going to capitalize on it. The attack today, I think, also has to send an incredibly strong uh, message to everybody that Afghanistan is incredibly vulnerable to additional players to come in. So my recommendation would be civil society organizations have to be involved. Uh, you know, women-led organizations must be involved. Activists must be involved. Obviously, uh, you know, the UN as, as an international organization must be involved, the US and the EU. The challenge everybody is going to have to deal with is that the people of Afghanistan will have an incredibly hard time trusting this process because the same players installed and supported, uh, I, I have to be very careful with the words I choose here, were, were you know, were, were, were supported for the last 21 years and it took them under 11 days for everything to disintegrate. So trust building and for the 35 million people who have watched all of this unfold over the last 20 years, we, I mean, the international community is gonna have an incredibly hard time building that trust. Um, other comments? No, okay. Uh, a question just came in here during our conversation about uh, the events today and the tragic attack at the airport, and it was mentioned earlier by Mahan to a certain degree. Uh, does this current incident and the fact that the, the attacks are uh, victimizing uh, the Taliban, ordinary civilians, and US and international uh, players, uh, does this provide an opportunity in a way for uh, the groups to try to come together and unite around a program for a new government and, and also for the security protection that's needed now against not just uh, ISIL, but other, other uh, armed actors that are still in the country. Can this be a, a moment uh, of opportunity when the sides come together and perhaps agree on a, a power sharing uh, inclusive formula that could work? Um, may I ask maybe Mahan to come back to this point? Uh, Oh boy. 
you know, um, every moment is an opportunity, depends on how we see the world. And so if the inclination here is they're all crazy, they're all one group, it's hard to distinguish between one from the other, uh, then I really am afraid of this, this, this chaos just uh, increasing and the situation disintegrating. In order for this to be an opportunity, we need a level of sophistication, a level of literacy about, uh, about the society, about the various different groups, maybe about Sharia and some level of restraint. Our goals need to be not goals, and by our goals, I'm talking about the main powers who are external, United States, not of domination and control and how can we maximize our influence here, but they need to be shift to an altruistic goal of genuinely wanting peace and what's good for the people there. The history that we've seen maybe over the past century, a few centuries, definitely the past 20 years, doesn't demonstrate that kind of empathy. If we can have that, this is an opportunity. If we regress back to the primal so reptilian instincts that are driven by you know massive industries, then uh, I've really I'm fearful. So I'm just, you know, spontaneous here. Others, please help. Yeah, uh, Laurie, please. David, just to frame it, and, and I want to, to frame it by emphasizing the importance of interests. And I say that because certainly at the Kroc Institute, we place, place a lot of importance on values, norms, um, principles, as do other sectors of the international community. And I've mentioned that with respect to the UN. But it's also worth thinking about the crisis and opportunities from the perspective of interests. And if we pose the questions, who has an interest in chaos and violence in Afghanistan? And who has an interest in peace and stability in Afghanistan? then there becomes the opportunity to form alliances notwithstanding serious, significant, normative, ethical differences of view where there are common interests. So there may be groups across the ideological and from our perspective, ethical spectrum with respect to peace and stability, but they have a common interest in peace and stability. And there's an opportunity and the potential then for alliances on that basis. Okay. So um, let me, uh, maybe as we're finishing up the panel here, uh, ask uh, each of the panelists maybe for uh, a final observation in terms of the most urgent priority now for us as individuals, uh, but also for uh, the US government and the international community. Maybe Samaya, if I could ask you. Uh, sure. Uh, again, uh, I believe that international community can can uh, use their leverages and put pressure on the on Taliban. And uh, but for what and what should be the focus of that? I mean, from from the perspective of an educator and someone who see the real miracle happens when the community and the mass is educated. For me, the red line is education the right for education for girls, the right for them to go to university, get basic primary, secondary and tertiary education, and then they are allowed to go to uh, work uh, and work a workplace. So uh, it's something that I really believe as Mon also uh, mentioned, for, for, for us it's important that we empower our uh, people with education. If they are able to read and write, and if they able to, uh, able to voice their needs and concerns, then they will be, will be able to negotiate and with Taliban or whoever in power. So it's something that I, I really ask everyone, uh, in addition to um, other priorities, like we are now in humanitarian situation in Afghanistan. In addition to that, let's focus on education as well. Thank you. Thank you. Salim. Thank you. A few, a few very, very key points. Um, I think for, for all of us as individuals, whoever is able to go back to Afghanistan and work, I think that work has to start now. 
there are opportunities. There is, a, there is an announcement of general amnesty. I think it's upon all of us to take that document it. And every time we face a challenge, we raise it up and say, this is what you said. Holding the Taliban government or you know, whatever form they have accountable is not just the international community. I think the, the critical mass that we have and everybody who's able to work in Afghanistan, it's our job to do that. It will be risky, it will be hard, it will be difficult. But this is now the time, uh, the time to do that. Please support anyone who is currently in Afghanistan and working and who wants to restart and resume its work you know, in, 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 in Afghanistan. Please stay in touch with everybody that you know is currently in Afghanistan, either an activist or an NGO or a peacemaker or a grassroots organization. This is the time that they heavily rely and depend on you and on all of us to raise their voices, give them an opportunity to speak and let them promote peace. Uh, that, that would, th th those would be the three or four things that I would emphasize. Thank you. Lisa. Well, we thought we had until the 31st of August to help evacuate our colleagues. And it looks like that window is closing today um, as, as US forces are starting to already pull out. So uh, we have been pushing Congress to keep that window open longer. Um, I think that that's the first step. The second step is to press the Taliban not to retaliate. And then the third step, as Mahan said, we have to really critically examine the military industrial complex, the whole economic situation of the defense industry that, that pushed this type of massive intervention. We know now that it does not work. Uh, so military-led peace building, peace interventions um, have failed. And we have to come to terms with that and really divert resources to other ways of addressing this problem through supporting women's movements, uh, social movements around the world, pushing for democracy and human rights from the inside, because that's really the only track record that has uh, legitimacy as a sustainable change for peace. Wonderful. Mahan? Yeah. You know, I, first of all, I think just have a lament um, to the Ummah, like the Muslims, where are you? Like Saudi Arabia, Iran, UAE. I mean, Pakistan is in the mix. There's the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Uh, I mean, think a little bit about your sisters and brothers and um, try just not to be instruments all the time of great power rivalry. Think for yourselves forge your own path, do something good in the world, make something new. Don't let this go on. So it's a lament. I know it's going to fall, just disappear in cyberspace, but that's what I'm feeling deeply. And then from, for us here in the United States, especially, we need literacy. We need to think differently about uh, these conflicts. We need to think critically and we need a different foreign policy. Uh, I wanna just quote Rabbi Michael Lerner I love his global Marshall Plan. You know, when we speak of one or two, I'm just gonna be very brief, one or two trillion dollars. If you think about what a trillion is, if you were to count seconds, in order to reach a trillion seconds today, you'd have to start in like 30,000 BC. It's a massive amount of uh, money. If you take a small portion of that and devote it to different causes, different kind of engagement in the world, I mean, this would be a completely different planet. And so think people on the Hill um, about uh, our place here, it's deteriorating. We're losing our place in the world. And whatever we have left, I mean, uh, maybe there's still hope, maybe it's not too late. So look inward. Laurie. Right. Just to, to emphasize again, um, one of my messages earlier, I think we have a responsibility to listen to our Afghan friends inside and outside Afghanistan, to elevate and amplify their voices and to be responsive to their needs and their pleas. For the Kroc Institute and similar institutes, I think we have a responsibility to be assertive publicly that our, that our critique of a militarist approach to peace building is not naive and romantic but that rather the evidence supports our position 
that a non-violent, non-coercive, non-imperialist and non-militarist approach to peacemaking and peace building is far more likely to be sustainable and meet the needs and interests of the people concerned. So it's an evidence pragmatic argument as well as a normative one. Right. Well, thank you to all of you panelists for your insightful, heartfelt, uh, really um, crucial comments here on the situation in Afghanistan today. And uh, we'll have additional conversations uh, here at the Keough School and the Kroc Institute. Next Wednesday, for example, we're starting a series on the meaning of the 9-11 attacks on the US and the US response. And our featured speaker will be Andrew Basevich. So uh, register for that if you've not already done so. And stay tuned to the Crack Institute and Keo School websites as we uh, sponsor additional programs and try to address this crisis uh, in, into the future and in cooperation with so many others. So again, thank you. And thank you all in the audience for staying with us and participating.